Good afternoon, everyone, um, and good morning to those of you uh, further west than I am. Uh, this is Kira Zeidelman with NARUC, um, just welcoming you to our fifth uh, carbon capture utilization and storage webinar. Um, I'm going to pass things over to Holly Taylor from the Western Interstate Energy Board, our co-sponsor for this series, um, for uh, her introductions of our two speakers today. I'd also just like to thank the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Fossil Energy for uh, making this webinar series possible. So over to you, Holly. All right. Well, thank you, Kara. And good morning, good noon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Holly Taylor. I'm the Director of State, Federal, and International Affairs at the Western Interstate Energy Board. And first, I just want to thank Kara and Nehruk for all the work you've done to facilitate this event. I think it's gone really, really well. Um, this is the fifth webinar in our Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage Workshop series. Last week in Project Update Part 1, we took a look at domestic CCUS development efforts. And now this week in Project Update Part 2, we're going to take a look at international CCUS development efforts. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. We're really excited to have two experts with us today. We have Jeff Erickson. Jeff is the general manager for client engagement at the Global CCS Institute. Um, that's an international think tank whose mission is to accelerate the deployment of carbon capture and storage as a vital technology to addressing climate change and delivering on climate neutrality. And we also have Beth Hardy Valiajo. Beth is the Vice President of Strategy and Stakeholder Relations at the International CCS Knowledge Center. And that's a knowledge center that works to accelerate the deployment of CCS worldwide by supporting research, learning, and information sharing. So we are really thrilled to have you both with us today. Um, thank you for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker. I think Jeff is, is up to get us started. All right, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Holly. And I just want to make sure, first of all, that you all can hear me. Holly, uh, can you give me a sound check? You're coming through loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. Very good. Uh, so first, I would also like to thank Weeb and Nehruk for the opportunity to speak today and for sponsoring this series of workshops uh, on carbon capture and storage. Um, I'm going to be talking about what's happening outside of North America. And perhaps uh, the first question that I should answer is why should you care? Why should you care what's happening thousands of miles away and in countries with different um, political and geological um, and natural systems? A and uh, I think there's two answers to that. First, I think it's important to understand that CCUS uh, carbon capture utilization and storage is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just happening here in North America, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, as so many of our businesses are international or have international elements of it, uh, it's important to, to be able to understand this global market trend that is continuing to grow. The, the second uh, reason for, I'll say listening for the next hour, is that um, I would hope that there's some useful information, statistics, um, ideas, approaches that you can take um, and apply to your own business and your own responsibilities, um, because there are approaches that are being taken around the world that are relevant um, to all CCUS efforts, regardless of where they are. So with that, just a, a word, and Jasmine, if you could please advance. Um, just a word about the Global CCS Institute and who we are and what we do. Um, as Holly said, we're an international think tank. We uh, are membership-based organizations, and our membership includes governments, businesses, um, and NGOs, and uh, research institutions. We have about 76 members currently, um, and um, they are uh, based actually on every continent except uh, Antarctica. So um, we've got six offices around the world. In addition to the office that I work in in Washington, D.C., we have offices in Brussels and London, um, Beijing, Tokyo, and our headquarters are in, is in Melbourne. Our mission, as Ali said, is to accelerate deployment of CCS. And there are three ways that we do that. First, um, we through advocacy, we build support through our intelligence uh, efforts we build knowledge 
and through connections, we seek to build community. Uh, next slide, please. So when I think about what's happening around the world um, with respect to CCUS, one word comes to mind, and that is momentum. And um, as you'll see over the next several uh, slides, momentum is occurring all around the world, again, not just in North America. Why is that? Why is CCUS starting to get so much traction everywhere you look? Well, first, um, there's several factors, and I think first and probably foremost is that there is a, a continuing broad and, and growing acceptance of the reality of climate change and the fact that um, a 20% reduction in CO2 emissions or improving energy efficiency is not going to do it, that the world needs deep decarbonization. And with that acknowledgement that um, uh, significant reductions in, in carbon emissions actually to get to net zero are required, then there's a wider understanding of the essential role of carbon capture and storage. Uh, if you look at the IPCC reports, the IEA reports, uh, many of the other research bodies, deployment of, of CCUS is required at scale under essentially any net zero scenario. CCUS is a mature technology. We've been capturing CO2 for about 100 years now, and we've been uh, storing it in the, in the subsurface for uh, almost 50 years now. And that technology is deployed globally. We're cost competitive today. Now that might surprise you because you always hear about how expensive CCUS is, but when you look at other ways to achieve deep, dark, deep, deep decarbonization, uh, CCUS can be cost competitive with other options. Um, another uh, misunderstanding is that CCUS and renewables strictly compete with each other. And in fact, they're complementary. And if you look at um, total systems and, and uh, the need, uh, particularly in the energy sector, the need to um, provide reliable, low carbon, uh, affordable electricity, the complementarity of renewables and CCOs is obvious. Hydrogen is going to be an important part of the future. And blue hydrogen, in other words, hydrogen that is um, created uh, from fossil fuels coupled with CCUS, uh, the cost is well below the cost of green hydrogen, that is hydrogen created strictly by renewables. And finally, uh, I'll say the final reason for this momentum that we're seeing is a recognition that um, we will likely overshoot whatever target it is that uh, that's your favorite, the two degree target, the 1.5 degree target, and we will need to pull CO2 from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide removal is an essential element of uh, CCUS. Next slide, please. So I keep talking about momentum. What does that look like? Well, if we look back uh, 10 years now, um, the first half of the previous decade was a bit rough for CCUS. Uh, um, we were recovering globally from the financial crisis and that was reducing the amount of investment that was available both to governments and businesses. And so while, uh, as you can see in the red bars on the bottom, those are facilities that are in operation, while those uh, increased over time, um, the, the pipeline shrunk until about 2017. And then over the last three years, that pipeline of projects in development has continued to grow. We're currently, uh, capturing and storing about 40 million tons per year on a global basis. Cumulatively, since we've been, I'll say, keeping track, uh, we've stored about 260 million tons to date. Now, I will say that um, uh, there'll be several slides and graphs that you'll see as I, as I go through the presentation today, um, which are leaving out 2020 data. And uh, this will be my first pitch for the global status of CCS report that will be coming out in December. That's our flagship report. We produce it every year, and that gives everyone um, a, a clear picture of where CCUS is and where it's going. So be on the lookout for that. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is our bubble chart. Um, this kind of plots out all of the uh, CCUS projects in construction and development and operation around the world. Um, on the vertical axis are the various industries or types of facilities where CCUS 
uh, projects are applied and the uh, across the horizontal is the timeline. Um, the size of the bubble uh, represents the amount of, of CO2 that's stored in the subsurface on an annual basis. Um, so Jasmine, if you could click one more time, please. There are 21 facilities that are currently in operation. Click again. And uh, three that are currently under construction. And uh, two more times, if you would. 16 that are in advanced development and 19 in early development. By advanced development, we mean that they've gone undergone, or they're, sorry, they, they've undergone a feasibility study. They've moved into the process of front end engineering and design feed studies. Um, and uh, the 19 that are in early development then are, are those that have a viable business model identified. There are a lot of other ideas. There's a lot of other scratch pads that are out there. Um, these are projects in, in development, advanced development, early development that are real and have a significant opportunity actually to advance into um, construction and operation. Next slide, please. And you'll see, sorry, uh, back up Jasmine, if you would. There you go. Thank you. I just wanted to make note of the power generation facilities. You can see that in power generation to date, there are only two facilities that are operational. In fact, one Petronova is not currently operating uh, due to the crash in oil prices that um, support their business model. Um, but there are only two and they're both on coal fired power plants, again, both in North America. But as you look to the right and you look at those projects in advanced, in, in advanced development, uh, all of those uh, dots representing new projects are in the US. So um, that's being driven to a large part by the incentives by 45Q, um, as well as the support that we've seen from, from both state and federal government. Next slide. And despite uh, what I said earlier about momentum happening all around the world, the US uh, continues to dominate the CCUS landscape, both with facilities in operation and those in development. Next slide. One of the uh, trends that we see all around the world is um, a change to the operational model of CCS facilities. And in the early days, typically there was one source of CO2, there was one oil field to put it and one pipeline in between. And that's changed really significantly over the last couple of years um, and again, moving forward. And so now we're seeing 16 CCS hub and clusters. So this is a network, this is multiple um, uh, multiple CO2 um, sources, um, often more than one storage facility. Um, so that provides operators of both the storage facility or enhanced oil recovery as the case may be. And um, the capture unit provides them with uh, significant flexibility and reduces the amount of risk associated with that. Uh, Jasmine, one click please. And I'm highlighting this little island off of Europe and, I'm, and next slide. We're going to um, talk about two hub and cluster facilities in the UK, net zero Teesside and zero carbon Humber. And you'll see um, one of the things that's um, I think quite important, and we see this in almost all of the, the hub and clusters, there tends to be, I'll call it an anchor project. So if you think about going to the shopping mall, you'll get a big department store, which is your anchor tenant, and then a bunch of smaller uh, um, retail establishments as well. And that's a kind of a similar approach that a lot of these clusters are taking is they'll have uh, one large facility, quite often a power plant that's generating, um, in some cases, the majority of the CO2. And then in the first or second phase in the early phases, um, much smaller resources with the opportunity then to expand um, the number of, of sources um, that will tap into a common pipeline. And you can see that uh, in both cases, you know, significant volumes of, of CO2 uh, being captured and stored. Remember, we're capturing about 40 million tons per year. So between um, these two facilities, that would be equivalent to about three quarters of the current total CO2 that's captured on an annual basis. Next slide, please. Um, what do you see here? What, what's most prominent here? Well, certainly North America continues to dominate the landscape 
of current CCS facilities around the world. And I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes kind of popping through um, some of the different geographies and give you a sense uh, for what's what's uh, highlighted in each of those geographies. So next slide, please. We'll start in Europe. And, and uh, I think uh, one of the things that's driving investment in Europe is a commitment by the EU to be climate neutral by 2050. Um, and as far as development goes, one of the most significant developments that's enabling CCUS across the continent and including Europe is, uh, I'll say, a workaround to the London Protocol. So the London Protocol um, uh, reflects a ban on uh, shipment of waste between countries and CO2 was considered a waste and kind of got, I'll say, got caught up in that. Um, there has been a workaround that's been developed so that um, uh, individual countries can now agree to have CO2 transported across boundaries. So that opens up the opportunity for the Longship Project in Norway, for the Portos Project in the Netherlands, um, and, and for just about every one of the projects in, um, in Europe where trans, uh, trans-ocean shipment is a, is a requirement. The Norway project, uh, Longship, that may be a new project name to you. You may be familiar with Northern Lights or the Norway uh, full, full chain project. They've, I'll call it rebranded as Longship. Uh, they've received a final investment decision by the government just in the last couple of weeks to complement the final investment decision by the private sector as well. And so, uh, pardon the pun, but Longship is full speed ahead and, and we're expecting them to begin construction probably very early in 2021. I mentioned the two cluster projects in the UK. There are many projects that are in development in the UK and nearly all of them um, reflect the, the hub and cluster approach. In the Netherlands, a really interesting project at the port of Rotterdam. Um, again, uh, numerous CO2 sources, a single pipeline that the port is, the port of Rotterdam is actually uh, uh, building. Um, there will be an opportunity for various um, sources of CO2 to tap into that pipeline, and then their storage uh, facility is offshore. Uh, those are kind of the big three that we talk about, the UK, Norway, and the Netherlands, but there are many other countries around Europe that also have CCUS projects in development. Next slide, please. So the Middle East is a really interesting place right now as far as CCUS. Uh, is concerned, they, I believe the leaders, both in the private sector and in government, are seeing the need for a low carbon future. Um, and they're trying to figure out what role the, uh, their industry, particularly their oil and gas industry, will play in a low carbon future. Saudi Arabia has really embraced the circular carbon economy, and they have high ambitions for CCUS. Um, the other really big player on CCUS in the Middle East has been the United Arab Emirates. The El Riyadh plant has been in operation now for a couple of years. That's CCUS on a steel plant. Um, they are now in, uh, in development of El Riyadh 2, which is another enhanced oil recovery project. And uh, they're expecting to have more than 3 million tons a year being stored by 2025. Qatar made uh, an announcement just about a year ago that they've got CCUS on the Ras Lafan LNG plant. And um, they are currently uh, storing about 2 million tons a year and expect to more than double that over the next five years as well. And then there's also activity in CCUS in other countries such as Bahrain, Oman, and Kuwait. Next slide, please. In Asia, uh, Asia is a big place and it's a very diverse place and, and um, the bullets here re reflect that diversity. Singapore, um, as, uh, as small geographically as it is, is an economic powerhouse in Asia and they have a low emissions development strategy that has embraced CCUS. Now there's not a lot of, in fact, there's no place to store, store CO2. They don't have the right geology um, in Singapore to store. So they are looking at uh, agreements with uh, the Indonesian government, the Australian government, and others um, to store their CO2. In Southeast Asia, um, a lot of the gas fields that are offshore in Southeast Asia have very high CO2 content, 40% plus in some cases. 
And a lot of the international oil companies, particularly the Western, the Euro European and American oil companies are now saying, we're not going to develop these oil fields unless we can incorporate uh, CCS and, and actually achieve uh, a low uh, emissions operation. And so CCS is actually a requirement of investment, if you will, in many part, in, in parts of Southeast Asia. Japan, like Singapore, doesn't have anywhere to put the CO2. So they're developing international partnerships, um, particularly with Australia that, through the, high, the uh, hydrogen energy supply chain, which I'll talk a bit more in just a sec. Um, and they see themselves as the world's technology developer and technology exporter. China, just um, uh, at the UN General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, announced a commitment to net zero by 2050. They've got two facilities that are currently under construction and they are now focused on getting CCS on, uh, on their steel industry. And India, India, certainly an important player as far as CO2 emissions and climate change goes, have, have shown renewed and increased interest, again, both in the private sector and in government for CCUS. And we expect to see some activity in India um, rapidly growing. Next slide, please. Finally, in Australia uh, and New Zealand, the Gorgon project on the West Coast um, is, uh, has a capacity to store over three, almost three and a half million tons per year. They've currently been in operation for about a year and they've stored two million so far and they're continuing to ramp up. Uh, the Carbonet project in the southeastern corner of the country, um, they've established a, uh, a storage facility there and they're looking at various commercialization options. Santos is an Australian oil and gas producer. They've got a feed study uh, currently underway on a gas plant. Uh, I mentioned the hydrogen energy supply chain, uh, which is hydrogen that's being developed, blue hydrogen being developed from the coal fields in Australia and transported to Japan for their use. Um, and the Puakai project in New Zealand utilizes the alum cycle. So that's the same technology that's on the uh, net power facility outside of Houston and, and others. And not only are they storing uh, or generating power, but they're also generating uh, hydrogen and fertilizer. Next slide, please. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is a map of the various uh, enabling conditions for all the facilities that are currently in operation. And you can see um, that those enabling conditions vary pretty significantly. It's not uh, one plan that, that fits everyone. Um, and what you'll see uh, across the board is that every one of these facilities that have come to fruition and gotten to operation have more than one of those enabling conditions in place. And you know we expect to see that uh, to continue in this next wave of projects that are being developed. Next slide, please. So I want to finish with just a, a quick, <clears throat> excuse me, a quick look ahead of some of the things that we can really count on seen and some others that um, are, are a big question. So I'll start with trends. Um, climate change awareness. I, I think there's no, and it's not just awareness, it's understanding, it's recognition, it's acceptance of the need um, to address climate change in a serious way. That's going to continue to increase, particularly as um, the physical consequences of climate change become more and more clear. Net zero emissions, kind of the 2020 buzzword, if you will. Um, but that is being that that is a goal that's being um, announced both in the private sector and public sector, and we expect to see more and more announcements um, uh, on net zero emissions. And of course, CCS needs to play an important role in achieving net zero emissions. ESG, environment, social, and governance considerations, very important for investors. That importance is continuing to grow, and decarbonization becomes a more and more important, important part of that. CCS is an important part of decarbonization. This time we think the hydrogen economy is here for real. And I've said enough about that. Um, even though there's a lot of momentum all around the world, we expect to continue to see US leadership on CCUS, even though we're seeing uh, other places like Western Europe building quickly, investment in the Middle East, uh, Japan with their technology development um, and Southeast Asia continuing to come up on the, on the radar. And then finally, one, one more, Yasmin, if you would, please. Jasmine. Uh, these are the big questions. These are the things that are going to impact how quickly and how deeply CCUS is going to get deployed. What's the impact of COVID and the economic impacts of that? What's the future of fossil fuels? 
how quick and how deep is the decline in the use of oil and gas? Um, what role will geopolitics play? Right now, Australia and China and the US um, are mixing it up and, and um, that could play a role in international collaboration and cooperation. What will the color of hydrogen be? Will it blue, be blue? Will it be green? I expect it will likely be a combination of the two. Revenue model uh, for CCUS, there's still a lot of experimentation on that, and that is certainly not a settled issue at this point. Will any country leave it in the ground? In other words, will we, um, will we actually reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we utilize? Well, um, perhaps uh, as demand diminishes, yes, but as far as supplies go, um, that's, that's kind of an open question. How serious is the Middle East? Will they make the pivot? How serious is India? And how serious is China with their net zero commitment? So those are some things to watch, and those will all have an impact on the um, speed of the deployment of CCUS. Though I expect that um, uh, CCUS will continue to grow quickly uh, and, and substantially over the next decade. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. I'll hand it back to Holly. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, Kira, do we want to take questions at this time or do you want to save those to the end? We will save questions until the end, but I would encourage our audience members to submit their questions at any time. You can just send those into the uh, questions box um, and I will read them out at the end. Or alternatively, you can um, raise your hand uh, once Beth concludes her presentation and I can call on you to unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Um, but feel free to start sending those in uh, and we will get to questions uh, in about the, the final 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. All right, very good. Thank you, Kira. And we'll turn things over to Beth. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Um, you know, Jeff had the, the hard task of telling you about the whole world on CCS. I'm going to be a little shorter because I'm going to stick uh, a little closer to home here in North America and specifically in Canada. Um, our organization, the International CCS Knowledge Center, is an or international organization. Um, but Jeff and I like to tag team and uh, I let him take the heavy lifting. <laughs> uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So the International CCS Knowledge Center, um, we are an organization that was based on taking the lessons learned from the world's first um, commercial post-combustion capture facility, Boundary Dam, on a coal-fired power plant here in Saskatchewan, Canada, um, and trying to take those lessons learned and bring them to the world. So understanding the full chain realities of the complexities um, at this world-leading project we try and offer the insight into practical deployment considerations. The Knowledge Center, we, we place a high value on information and expertise that's you know, to be allowed to be broadly shared when there aren't IP considerations, and we know what those are, um, you know, to share that information with multiple parties. And we run to promote research innovation and that really the large scale deployment by reducing costs and risks associated with new CCS projects, you know, both domestically in North America and around the world. We really think that our unique ability here is that, you know, we have hands-on guidance with technical advice, planning, design, construction, and, and you know, that operation of large-scale applications of CCS. And we can, we can apply those to projects beyond coal, uh, to industrial processes and, and other things. So I think it's that practical form of cooperation that acts to ensure that potential CCS facilities save time and effort in developing workable projects. And the experience-based decision-making can avoid costly delays or allow projects to proceed quicker. Um, so accelerating deployment, just like Jeff was talking about. You know, by promoting and contributing to that technical advancement and cost reductions of, you know, next generation CCS, uh, we think, you know, it can be de-risking investment decisions as well. So we offer all those services with the engineers that actually built Boundary Dam, house that organization, but also um, that education, the guidance in terms of financiers, decision makers, and business case partners all play into that, um, right from the capture point all the way to, um, the storage or use for in-house order. 
So if I can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about Boundary Dam. Um, you can't see how many million tons, it's been over 3 million, it's cut off there on the bottom, for me anyway. Um, but this is the Boundary Dam CCS facility. It is the uh, power plant, is a coal plant here in Saskatchewan. It is not a hydro dam, though it's called a dam. Um, and so you'll see four stacks there. Um, the stack furthest to your the left of the screen um, is Boundary Dam Unit 3. That's what we capture the CO2 off of and actually get rid of all of the um, uh, pollution go from going in the air. So you'll see emissions coming out of the other stacks faintly there. But just for Unit 3, we capture, um, we have a capacity of capturing a million tons a year. If you go to the next slide. So, this was the world's first post-combustion coal-fired CCS project, and it's fully integrated because it actually retrofitted a coal plant. So this coal plant was here. We even still have um, those other units still operating. Four and five will be shutting down. Um, unit six will remain. The federal coal-fired regulations in Canada uh, only allow coal-fired units to operate until 2030. Um, however, because we're doing carbon capture, we're allowed to continue to operate, and in fact, we're actually allowed to balance our fleet-wide emissions using the emission reductions from uh, this unit. So basically, if we emit more in uh, one facility, it can be balanced out from the emission reductions that are happening from carbon capture and storage um, at Boundary Dam. So basically, this extended the life uh, of this plant, 45 years. And I know this is something that you know, the United States is really looking at as well. We we actually work with a lot of different companies in the United States um, because people are trying to figure out, well, is, is coal bad? Are the emissions bad? Do we need to shut these down? What are the jobs gonna look like? These are all very real concerns. And, uh, you know, it isn't about targeting an industry, it's about targeting their emissions. And if, especially if, if there are units that are young in their useful life, um, CCS is a solution for reducing those emissions and continuing on um, with those jobs in those communities, a lot of times rural communities. And that is the case as well. And we identify with that here in Southern Saskatchewan, near actually the North Dakota border and Montana border, um, you know, with, with the Boundary Dam project in a rural community. And so we actually, when we did this study, natural gas, the price of natural gas was um, much higher. And we decided to go forward with the Boundary Dam project in Saskatchewan because the costs were actually the inverse of each other, the capital cost for the project and the operating cost for the project uh, in terms of fuel. And so when things are all equal, we decided, well, over the lifetime, the cost of coal will remain low. And uh, we went for the CCS project. At the time, there were about 10 projects in the world going forward, uh, looking to go forward, I should say, with CCS. And in the end, Boundary Dam was the only one that, that continued on. I think we're gonna see a lot of a, a different um, atmosphere for that in this next wave of CCS, because there's lots of lessons learned from these projects such as Boundary Dam um, that can help people get off the ground. And so everybody doesn't have to start from ground zero. It's very important uh, to build upon learnings to save costs. So I just wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, the federal government gave $240 million to um, kickstart this. And the project itself ended up costing 1.5 billion Canadian dollars, uh, but that included an upgrade to the power island, the power plant, as well as the CCS retrofit. And we actually take that CO2 and um, we store it both in a, a deep saline reservoir and we sell it uh, for enhanced oil recovery. If you could go to the next slide. So just to talk about how many emissions are actually reduced. In Saskatchewan, a regular lignite coal plant, and this is pretty similar across the board, is 1,100 tons per gigawatt hour. The coal regulations in Canada, you have to get to 420, which is impossible for a coal plant to do. Um, and that's, you know, for its tons per gigawatt hour, not total tons over the year. Um, and so when you're reducing emissions, you think, oh, wind, you know, it, different renewables, these are zero. Well, in Saskatchewan, actually, wind is 275 to 325 tons per gigawatt hour um, because it has to be backed up with natural 
gas peaker stations because of the variable load. And actually CCS is cleaner than renewables. So that's all I really wanted to talk about, about how clean Boundary Dam actually is. Go to the next slide. So basically um, this just shows you what we do with that CO2 and what, you know, how to capture it from any project. Um, Jeff talked a lot about how there's offshore storage um, opportunities, there's deep sailing reservoir storage, using it for enhanced oil recovery actually um, permanently sequesters the CO2 as well, and I'm, you've heard that from um, other panelists in the series. And uh, in fact, when we use the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, it's 30% less well, or 37 even, we can see, uh, less greenhouse gas emissions than tr traditional extraction methods for oil. So this is really great because the CO2 goes into the ground and it swells with the oil and it creates more pressure and gets oil out of the ground, um, That especially for oil fields that have started to um, lose some of their, their useful life or decline in their production. So moving forward, um, what we did was we actually took the lessons learned of the Boundary Dam CCS study and we thought, how can we apply this and show cost reductions? And so I've actually took a um, graphic from the Global CCS Institute, thanks Jeff, um, to show the step change going from the first post-combustion on a coal plant to the Petronova plant, which Jeff mentioned, and then what taking those lessons learned looks like um, in a second generation facility. And just going 12, I'm gonna say kilometers, cause I'm a Canadian, but just going 12 kilometers, pretty close down the road um, at a comparable coal plant, double the size, we actually looked, um, used the technology vendor MHI, who provided the technology for the Petronova facility. We worked with them and did a study to find out how much it would cost. And we found it's not 20 to 30% cost reduction for second generation. We actually saw 67% less cost to do this. And that brings cost of capture down to about $45 US a ton. Um, and, and touching on what Jeff said about playing nice with renewables, um, we actually saw that the capture rate can reach up to 97% with a reduced load when the renewables are on the grid. So this actually shows that CCS um, on power can work really nicely um, with the different loads with renewables. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we don't need all these projects to be billion dollar projects for million ton capture. Um, applying lessons learned, you can re reduce the costs and that's what we're here to help with. So if you move to the next slide. So I'm gonna just focus a little bit on Canada so that um, you have some understanding of what's going on up here because we're real close and um, we also have have some notable projects um, so basically there are uh, let's say four large-scale capture projects happening in Canada right now so the boundary dam project that's ha been happening since 2014 has had over 3 million tons of co2 sequestered the shell quest project which is a blue hydrogen project um, capturing co2 from a an upgrader in uh, Alberta and has over uh, 5 million tons of co2 permanently sequestered it's not used for enhanced oil recovery and two projects um, in Alberta that feed into a hub trunk line. So um, the hub concept that Jeff was mentioning um, in Alberta, the Alberta carbon trunk line actually is, is a hub that's formed here. So there's a whole bunch of other things I wanna talk about and um, a lot of activity going on in the world and that's no different than in Canada. Um, there's a lot of new technologies coming on board and a lot of prospects for deployment. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. I wanted to talk first about, um, well, I've already talked about the Boundary Dam project, but I wanted to talk about the, the Weyburn oil field project because we actually take, this is fun. So we actually take CO2 from North Dakota. Um, and we have actually been storing over 35 million tons of CO2 in the Weyburn oil field using enhanced oil recovery for over 20 years. Um, North Dakota gasification has um, tons of CO2 across the border, not a problem. And so this is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you guys about today because, you know, CO2 reservoirs and uh, 
you know, emissions, they don't have borders. And just because I'm in Canada and you're in the United States doesn't mean that they are not opportunities for us to work together. And in fact, the uh, Western governors um, of Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, and the premier of Saskatchewan actually signed a memorandum of understanding to cooperate together to share lessons learned and knowledge on carbon capture and storage. And uh, there's been some working group activity. It's died off a little bit, um, but I think this is a real opportunity to figure out and understand what that could look like more. I think that the fact that there's already a CO2 pipeline happening um, between Canada and the United States is an opportunity potentially for more hub activity. There's a beautiful basin um, here for not only oil, um, and, but also permanent sequestration that, that stems from Alberta uh, to Saskatchewan and, and down into the United States. And so there are definitely opportunities. Um, you know, you see, 45Q stemming projects like Project Tundra with Minn Kota Power uh, in North Dakota, you know, and the, definitely the Glenrock uh, Petroleum project in Wyoming and, and different projects that are happening and more interest. You know, we're hearing a lot of things out of Wyoming in the past couple of weeks as well. And, and these are opportunities that nobody should have to uh, go in on alone and uh, De-risking investments is super important and, and showing those lessons learned and applying them. So that's kind of where I wanted, what I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to briefly just show about the, the Quest project um, and, and you know how great it is. You can see it here on the slide. I'm just gonna go through these quickly because I wanna really wanna to get to questions. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about Petronova as well. So you wanna to move to the next slide. So this is what I was talking about, about the Alberta carbon trunk line. Um, and I, you know, trunk lines are great because they're like a backbone and, and they can take on CO2 like an on-ramp on a highway and, uh, and take, have offshoots as well. So if you have different pockets of old and abandoned wells or different geological formations or different options that different industrial sources can put into. And with a hub, um, you know, Usually there's a, a cluster of activity in, in industrial emissions, and we're seeing that, you know, the oil and gas climate initiative, for instance, they're investing in these types of hubs. And, you know, Canada and the United States in this area, um, you know, is no different. And it has real potential for definitely for some of the best storage opportunities in the world. So moving forward. I'm um, just going to leave it on this slide for a second. So uh, people have been asking us a lot about the Petronova project and is this, you know, obviously it's unfortunate. Jeff mentioned that it has to do a lot with the, the price of, of oil and uh, we get questions on, well, the price of oil is obviously dropping in Canada as well. What's happening with the Boundary Dam project? And in fact, we actually ha are seeing our off taker, uh, the oil company, looking for more CO2. And uh, I think th these things will even themselves out as time continues. And uh, that demand for CO2 for enhanced oil recovery uh, will be there. You know, as Jeff mentioned, there's a lot to do with COVID and, and these types of considerations. Um, but the beauty of the Boundary Dam project is we also have a backup because it was made as an environmental project, not just a, a business model with oil recovery. Um, we actually have the Aquastore project, which acts as a backup for storage as well. So this, these are types of considerations to consider moving forward. Um, I know I spoke fast. I know I spoke about a lot of things, but I really want to talk about um, questions because we all know that uh, you know even power generation alone, CCS is you know, only at a capacity of you know one million tons now with Petronova coming off, um, and we need one point. 5 billion tons by the year 2040 under the International Energy Agency's sustainable development scenario. So, you know, these are proven technologies that are ready to be deployed. And what are the next steps? Not just for power generation, but for cement, iron and steel, chemical industry, et cetera. The Knowledge Center is actually looking, uh, working on a feasibility study on cement and applying this lessons learned from coal beyond power to uh, industrial process emissions where you know it's a very hard to abate sector. And we're doing that in Edmonton, uh, Canada right now, looking at what those economics look like. 
So with that, I'll leave it, um, but happy to answer a lot of questions, both about Canada, interaction with the US, um, and around the world, and what these net zero targets mean, and how CCS can help. All right. Thank you, Jeff Beth. Beth. Here, I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, Jeff and Beth, thank you so much for these presentations. It's really exciting to see the application of CCUS across the globe. So thank you for that. And I'll turn things over to Kira to get us started on questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Jeff and Beth, for those excellent presentations. Uh, we have gotten several questions in, so I'll try to get through as many as possible with the uh, 15 minutes or so that we have left. Um, first, we had a question uh, going into a little more of the comparison between Boundary Dam and Petronova. Um, if, uh, Beth, I think this is primarily a question for you since you discussed this a little bit in your presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about the um, cost comparison between those two projects, the, the cost of carbon and the kind of total cost of those projects, um, and the technology differences between them as well. I think, um, I may be wrong about this, but I believe uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries was the technology vendor for both of those projects. So maybe there is a little bit more in common. No, that's not right. No, that's I am happy to answer. Um, yeah, so the Boundary Dam project actually uses a shell can solve technology. Um, it's a, a, just a different solvent. So the way that carbon capture works uh, post combustion is there's an emission, we separate out the um, different blue gas particulates. So you know, there's particulate matter, the pollution that goes in the air, there's sulfur uh, dioxide, the way that you know, acid rain is, but when we target the CO2 specifically, this chemical that we've put in, it kind of trickles down and separates the CO2 um, in an absorber. And then we reuse that, um, that solvent. And that solvent is provided at Boundary Dam by Shell Cancel. In Petronova, it's provided by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, MHI. And, um, the difference in the projects, has, there are several differences, just to let you guys know, both on coal power, both retrofits of plants, um, but with the Petronova project, they actually built a natural gas turbine to include um, steam in the capture process mm -hmm. because um, actually new source review was one of the, the limitations. It was a bit of an administrative burden for the retrofit. Um, and so that was kind of a tack on. Um, in order to get this project to continue on time and on budget. Um, and so, you know, with the capture process, that wasn't a problem for Petronova in its, um, in its kind of mothball, I guess would say, or momentarily uh, shut down. It does have the ability to come back online. Um, so you know when the when things turn around a bit, I'm sure we will we can look forward to seeing that back online because of the need for these projects. Um, there, we actually have a, a blog from a um, incentives perspective on our website that you can check out um, on Petronova that was published in um, National Post, um, but also a technical blog talking about the technical differences and um, I. Be amiss to not not refer you to that to get more information, but um, of course we the, the engineers at Boundary Dam spoke with people at Petronova throughout, um, and we saw a lot of similar things come out the back end in terms of you know when you when you look at the DOE report from Petronova um, about the project, people say oh there were problems with capture, and um, in fact you know the capture project works. Um, but little things like gunk on fans or different things like that, we, we both identified similar issues and these are things we can learn from as well. So maybe I'll just leave it there, but happy to talk more with anybody who's interested. They can always contact me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we had another question on uh, storage sites. So in some of our previous webinars, we heard about the Department of Energy Carbon Safe uh, program to help develop large scale uh, carbon storage sites around the United States. Um, what are the measures that some uh, other countries have used to uh, to develop carbon storage states and determine that those sites are safe and secure uh, and able to actually sequester uh, large amounts of captured carbon dioxide? Jeff, do you want to go ahead? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. So um, <clears throat> it's important to recognize that there are various stages of evaluation, <clears throat> excuse me, of a particular site. So you start at the high level at the formation, you see where particular geologic formations are, um, and <clears throat> you move down from kind of a country level or, or, or a regional level, um, ultimately down to a, a selected site. And at each one of those kind of a screening process, right? And uh, at each one of those, there's a, a an engineering evaluation done on um, how effective um, that formation will be in accepting the CO2, so porosity and permeability, um, and also how uh, safe it will be, um, how how immobile, if you will, um, that CO2 will be. So that essentially requires a, a cap, both a cap rock and then call it a dome, a dome formation, or another way to to capture the CO2. Um, there's there's a lot of activity going on in in various countries. Um, most often, I would say those countries that have the most potential are those that are steeped in the oil and gas industry to start, right? So they understand their geology, and this is both public and private sector. They both understand their geology and they have an economic incentive to utilize those fields. So offshore Norway and depleted oil fields, there's a lot of analysis of what's happening excuse me, offshore Norway. Um, Middle East, they understand their geology really well. Those gas fields that I talked about in Southeast Asia, again, the incentive is there to continue to develop those. And so they have to have an appropriate understanding of that. One of the challenges with evaluating on a global basis, the um, storage capacity is that there's a lot of different methods um, that different countries apply to calculating the amount of CO2 storage they have available. OGCI in conjunction with uh, the Global CCS Institute and Put Tail Blue Dot are in the middle of a project right now to um, uh, to to formalize and uh, um, unify the methodologies that uh, various governments will play or, or utilize to evaluate their storage reservoirs. So there's a lot of activity going on. A lot of it's being driven by both countries and companies. Um, in the in the fossil business, if you will, um, and and the picture of how much is available and where continues to improve. I'll say that North America has the best geology and the highest level, uh, the highest capacity for um, storage availability in the world by far. Thank you. And our next question is about direct air capture. Um, this is, again, something we heard a little bit about last week in our U.S. domestic project update um, from uh, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures and the Clean Air Task Force, um, talking about DAC projects in development uh, here in the U.S. But um, can you give us kind of a, a sense of what the status is of these projects around the world and how, uh, how other countries are factoring direct air capture into meeting their uh, emissions reduction targets? Um, as well as kind of how director capture facilities might be cited um, given existing clean electricity or the location of carbon storage facilities or carbon uh, transportation infrastructure. Well, Jeff, maybe I'll just start and I'll, I'll let you, you talk a little bit more after, but, um, you know, carbon engineering is a direct air capture um, that's founded here in, in Canada. And in fact, um, we're seeing them pick up and, and you've heard um, move to do a, a 1 million ton project in the United States. And so we're actually seeing competitiveness concerns based on the uh, 45Q incentive because of the you know ability to get those incentives back um, with direct air capture in, in the States and not in Canada equivalently. So, um, you know, when, talking about the carbon engineering, they will they'll tell you if there's the ability to do post combustion capture or capturing right off a stack, um, that will always be the cheapest, right? Because it hasn't gone into the air yet. Um, but like you said, finding sites and and putting them where storage is is the potential. If there's not an industrial emission there, um, that is definitely an, an opportunity. And, and Jeff can speak more to um, the, the global uh, outlook on that. Well, I, I think there's a broad recognition that direct air capture is going to absolutely be essential, uh, around, again, around the globe. Um, there's a European company called Climeworks. There's a U.S. company called Global Thermostat, uh, along with carbon engineering. Those are kind of the big three. So uh, uh, Climeworks is based in Switzerland. So those countries are, uh, I think, probably as far ahead as anyone else with, with DAC. 
but it's early stage, right? It's very early stage technology. This is a technology that's going to continue to grow, but as far as the amount of CO2 that's being captured and stored, tiny right now and, and tiny over the next decade, um, uh, but absolutely essential and will continue to grow. Um, Beth mentioned, look, the concentration of CO2 in a coal-fired power plant is about 12%. Concentration of CO2 in ambient air that DAC is trying to capture is 0.04%. Okay, so it's um, you can just see the physics problem, and that's that's the cost. That, that's why it costs so much more at this point. Technology is going to continue to improve. But one of the one of the big advantages DAC has is essentially you can put it anywhere. You can put it next to a pipeline. You can put it next to a CO2 EOR field, um, which is what actually Oxy and Carbon Engineering are doing in um, in the Permian Basin. So uh, a lot of benefits to DAC. Um, technology will continue to improve. Uh, uh, volumes are tiny at this point, but will continue to grow. And again, complementary to um, uh, to point source capture and both required geologic storage at scale. Great. Um, we have a couple more questions. I'll try to get through in our remaining time. Um, so uh, Beth, there was a, a kind of clarifying question for you, Jasmine. If we could go back a couple of slides, there was a, um, I think it was a bar chart that was showing the operating costs of uh, Shand and Boundary Dam. Um, and we had a question just asking uh, if you could elaborate on the uh, dramatic reduction in operating costs um, between Shand and Boundary Dam. Yeah, sure. Um, so we actually have a really uh, a decision maker level study on our website. Uh, it's, called, it's the Shan report um, and also like our super detailed 100 plus page technical report on the actual differences. And we're also happy to walk anybody through that um, on a separate presentation. Um, but some of those things include modularization, some of them include heat integration and using reusing your steam internally, um, site and location. Um, you know, there are numerous, numerous things in, uh, that were learned, redundant heat exchanger redundancies. Um, you know, there, there are many technical things that, that were differences um, and, and lots of iterations that can apply not only to coal, um, but beyond to other industrial applications that, uh, you know, and, and this is just the reality of these first projects. Um, it is a separate presentation in itself and uh, one that is very much more technical than I can uh, provide you, but, you know, definitely significant uh, cost differences and, and um, I think it's something that those, it will apply differently to on a case by case basis to each facility, right? And so um, that's why Shand is so beautiful because it was so similar. Uh, just economies of scale alone um, show a lot of the cost reduction. So when you look targeting like smaller facilities, so we, we get asked, hey, can we do carbon capture on natural gas pipelines on the, the stations along a pipeline? The answer is completely yes. Um, but as things are smaller, the costs are gonna go up to capture because you're trying to access the CO2. If you have a lot of CO2 available to be accessed, it's going to be cheaper um, as your tons go up. So that's where we, because we went from 1 million tons to 2 million tons, economies of scale alone is what drove a lot of the cost. Thank you. And I think with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. We do have a few more questions in the queue. And uh, I will follow up with Jeff and Beth uh, to connect our audience members that still had questions uh, that we unfortunately did not have time for. Um, but I did want to uh, mention some upcoming events before we conclude today. Um, so, of course, this is the fifth in our series of six webinars on carbon capture, utilization, and storage with WEEB. So we hope you can join us next week for the final webinar on regulatory considerations and policy recommendations for CCUS. That will be with Chairman Kara Fornstrom of the Wyoming Public Service Commission and Doug Scott from the Great Plains Institute. Um, moving to the next slide. There are some other uh, upcoming NARUC events. Um, we have a few webinars coming up uh, this month and next month, and our annual meeting and education conference in November. And going to the next slide, I think we have a, our uh, upcoming WEEB events. Holly, do you want to uh, talk about this meeting? Yeah, thank you, Kara. So just a quick plug. 
Um, we have our Fall 2020 Joint Krebsy YRAB webinar series coming up. It will start the Friday after the CCUS workshop concludes, beginning on Friday, October 23rd, and running for the three consecutive Fridays after that. So uh, we'll be looking at current and emerging electricity trends, challenges, and opportunities in the Western Interconnection. And we hope that you can join us there. If you go to the website, westernenergyboard.org, you can see a draft agenda there. Thanks, Kira. Thank you, Holly. And uh, I hope our audience will join me in thanking again, Beth and Jeff for your uh, wonderful remarks today and for answering so many of our audience questions. And again, thank you to WEEB and the US Department of Energy Fossil Energy Office for sponsoring this series. Uh, so we hope to see everyone next week. And in the meantime, have a uh, lovely weekend. Thank you thank so you. much for having me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.